you see in the bulletin and what you'll be seeing focused on the bulletin, that is the saints triumphant. Remember, in, in the church, there's a distinction between the saints militant and the saints triumphant. Saints militant would be you and, and me. People who know Jesus as their Savior, but are still having to slog through this world of pain and trial and trouble and tribulation. Saints triumphant, however, are those saints who have now rested from their labors, as the hymn says, who, who don't have to deal with sin because they are already in heaven. They would focus on both of those saints, both living and in heaven already. We'll be using a special service that you'll find in your service folders. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for, and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. They were longing for a better country, a heavenly home. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared the city for them. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. Too often we have set our minds on earthly things and not on things that are above. Therefore, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin.
safe trip on Sunday, so we will see six of our members who used to sit where you are sitting, who used to pray with you, who used to confess their faith with you, who used to sing with you, but now who are doing all of that in, in heaven. It's also a good time for us to remember those who have gone before them, <coughs> your loved ones, maybe a family member, maybe a, a friend or a loved one who has died also in the Lord. But remember, as a Christian, this is not a, a time to be sad. This is a time to rejoice that God has given them their reward in heaven. We begin. I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, says the Spirit. Let them rest from their hard work, for whatever they have done accompanies them. We remember those who, together with us, stood at the foot of the cross, who heard the Easter truths of the empty tomb, and who have gone before us into the heavenly mansions of heaven, including our members Mary Watalowitz, Kent Allison, Diane Bartelt, Mildred Bogenschneider, Teresa Ehlers, and Alan Schaefer. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash.
Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not perceive those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is the word of the Lord.
for this sage tramp this Sunday is taken from the Old Testament lesson from Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Where again, you might not see the immediate connection, but there is a, a, a wonderful connection between what God inspired Daniel to write in these verses, what God showed Daniel in a vision that he gave him, and between those things and, and what we have to look forward to in heaven someday. Dear brothers and dear sisters in Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, quick quiz to start. <clears throat> One of the most well-known, scariest stories in the book of Daniel. Three might come to mind. One of them we just heard two weeks ago on Reformation Sunday where we heard about Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego being thrown into the lion, not the lion, but the fiery furnace. And I just gave away the second one. Daniel in the lion's den. That's probably the second most scary one and most well-known story from the book of Daniel. Can you think of a third one? It's not one that you've heard in Sunday school. <coughs> Maybe the, the exile to Babylon that, that, that Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Ben were part of, but that's not really the most well-known or the scariest one. We're taking a look at it this morning. It's the dream that God showed Daniel in chapters 10 and 11. It's a, a scary, scary story. It's a, one that will, will shake you to your core. But then... Thankfully, chapter 12, the end of the book of the Daniel, <coughs> it'll give you a good idea. And that's why I say this is probably the, the third most well-known story in the book of Daniel. In this dream that, that God gave Daniel, Daniel was able to see huge nations, powerful nations, rise and fall. The Persians under King Xerxes, or the Greeks under Alexander the Great, if you remember your, your history from high school. These were the nations that rose and were in power for a while, but then were laid waste by the next big country. This is what God told Daniel in his dream. But before he took Daniel to heaven, he gave him one last prophecy. And it did not end on a scary note. It did not end on a sad note. It ended on a wonderful note that reminded Daniel of, and through Daniel, of what we can look forward to one day when our judgment day comes. When, when it's our death day, because that's judgment day for many of us, or if Jesus comes back before we die, that's our judgment day. That doesn't really matter. That's a day that we can look forward to. As much as everybody else in the world says, I don't want to face my death, I don't want to talk about my death, I don't want to plan anything about my death, this is the day that Christians can rejoice because we know that on that day the saints are triumphant. In verse 1, Daniel gives us a little picture of, of this dream. And he says, In the last days there is going to be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of nations, from the very beginning of nations, until right then. In other words, this world, if you think it's bad, get ready because it's going to get worse and worse and gradually worse until Jesus decides that that is the day that he is going to come. Now some people, and they've always been around, would be skeptical of what the Bible talks about when it says that. Because the Bible does talk about the fact that there is an end. There was a beginning of the world, but there's going to be an end of the world. People don't believe that because they say, well, we were here yesterday, we're here today, we're going to be here tomorrow. Stop trying to scare people with your Bible thumping, with your Bible talking about the last days. That's only scaring people. The world's not getting worse, it's actually getting better. Don't you understand? Look at technology advances and science advances and medicine advances. We're living longer years as a general rule. Why do you tell people, skeptical people would say, that this world is going to end, and it's going to get worse before it ends. Why do we tell people that? 
Because that's what God tells us. He says the evil that is going to accompany the last days is going to be unprecedented. Paul spoke to the skeptics in his day when he wrote this in 1 Thessalonians. When people are saying peace and safety all around, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape them. Jesus himself quoted this verse from Daniel chapter 12, verse 3, when he said, his disciples asked him about what's going to happen at the end of the days. He said this, For, the, for then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. You, you've heard the signs. You, you've heard, if you've been in church for your life, the signs that will accompany the end times. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 24 and 25, probably give us, gives us the best picture of what we can look forward to or what are going to be those signs considering the ends of times. He says there's going to be wars and there's going to be rumor of, rumors of wars. If that's the sign, haven't we been seeing the signs? Wars and rumors of wars. We just got out of a, a war that's been going on for who knows how many years. The next one, he says, famines and earthquakes. Have we not seen that people don't have food in different countries and different places? Have we not seen natural disasters like earthquakes that cause tsunamis and other natural disasters? He says, the love of many will grow cold. What, now, what does that mean? The love of many will grow cold. That's the spiritual apathy that you can see in the world. People could care less about God. People could care less about what God wants. People could care less about what God says is right and what is wrong. People don't care about those kinds of things. Do any of those things sound familiar? Turn on your TV. Read your newspaper or listen to the radio. It should sound familiar because this is what is going on in these last days. And it's not just the people around us, it's among Christians as well. We are suffering the birth pains. We are suffering what Jesus tells us to look forward to before the end of the age comes. We suffer and we die. Why? Because these are consequences of the sin that is running rampant in our world. What does God remind us of here, however? That the days leading up to Jesus' second coming, even though the, the first coming that was joy, and we'll, we'll celebrate that in a month and a half, the, the little baby Jesus is born in Bethlehem, that's joy and that's peace and that's wonderful, wonderful news. But the second coming of Jesus, the days leading up to that day, there's going to be more distress and more trouble and more evil and wickedness that this world has ever seen. Which reminds us to be what? Watchful. And, and on guard. And repentant of our sins before it's too late. That's bad news. That's scary stuff that we talked about at the beginning. But then in the middle of this dream of wickedness and rampant trouble and evil and distress, Daniel sees a figure. The figure is the angel Michael. Now, now, if you don't know Michael, or who Michael is, Michael is an angel. The book of Jude describes him as the archangel. He's the leader of all of the angels. Right when it seems that the world cannot take any more wickedness and evil, and evil Michael, this archangel, arrives on the scene. And, and what is he doing? He's there to guard God's people. He says, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. <clears throat> this is not just a church teaching that only church people will understand. This is what God tells us will happen at the judgment day. Everyone who has ever lived and everyone who has ever died on Judgment Day will be raised from the dead on Judgment Day. Some will go to heaven. <clears throat> Some will go to hell. Everlasting shame and contempt, Daniel says. The question for us is, are we ready for that day? If it were today, would you be ready for that 
day. There, there's no better day, there's no better time to think about that than today on Saints Triumphant Sunday or in the season of end times. Sometimes people put flowers on the altar. <clears throat> I think it happened today as well. In memory of someone, in memory of a loved one, who has gone before us into heaven? When we read their names in church on, on St. Triumphant Sunday, or, or when you think of dad, or mom, or grandma, or grandpa, or son, or daughter, whoever it is, who has died in the Lord in the past who knows how many years, that should prepare you, that should remind you of the fact that Judgment Day is coming. But it's not something to be scared about. It's something as Christians that we can say, yes, we're looking forward to that day. Saints triumphant, not saints militant who are struggling, but saints triumphant who don't have to bear the wickedness and the evil and all the consequences of their sins any longer. The Bible calls them saints. Sometimes they're called the holy ones. Now, now what does it mean to be a holy one and how do we know for sure that we are numbered among the saints triumphant and not the ones who are going to go to shame and everlasting contempt? I won't make you raise your hand. I won't ask you to raise your hand. But are you are you a saint in God's eyes? Are, are you holy in God's eyes? Do I need to ask your wife or your husband or your mom or your dad if you are holy in God's eyes? Here, here's what a saint means. Here's what a holy one means. <clears throat> if there was a file cabinet, and there's been movies about this. <clears throat> I'm thinking of one right now where all of your actions and all of your words and all of the life that you have lived from the time that you entered this world until right now, if you had a file or a filing cabinet that recorded all of those things, you know what being a saint is? It's not going to take up ten filing cabinets to make sure that it includes all the bad things that you have said or thought or done. You would not be ashamed to have your spouse read it. Even though you probably would be ashamed to have your spouse read a story of your life. You would not be ashamed to have God read it because you are a saint. <clears throat> a saint means that God looks at all the things that we have done in our life, the, the body of work in our life, and he says, forgiven. Not because that was a good person down there, not because he was a, a better than average person, forgiven through the merits and the work of Jesus Christ our Savior. There would not be a single line, a single phrase, a single word that you uttered that you would be saying, oh, I don't want God to read that. And I don't want them to read about that. We, we confess our sins at the beginning of the service, but then what happens at the end of that confession? You are forgiven, reminded that you are forgiven on the basis of what Jesus has done for us. The book of life, that, that's what we're talking about. So, so what is this book of life that Daniel refers to? In the book of Revelation, <clears throat> God calls it the Lamb's book of life. And this is Jesus' book, and it starts off by telling us how Jesus lived a holy life. In the second chapter, it's kind of scary because it talks about how Jesus died and didn't just die, but the company that suffered was horrific. And, and we don't want to wish that on anybody. The third chapter, however, is good again. Because it reminds us that Jesus did not stay dead, but he rose again. And it connects us with what Jesus did. His perfect life is our perfect life. His innocent death is the death that is not going to bother us, because it is followed by his resurrection to eternity. And that's what we as saints can look forward to. When, when God looks down from heaven, he sees you. He does not see who you think that you are. Or who you know that you are. Because you know your sinful actions. You know your thoughts. And you know your words. God sees the cross superposed over you. And therefore he sees this white robe of righteousness covering you. Do, do you want to be ready for the end then live as a, re as a forgiven child of God. If you want to be 
ready for the end times or judgment day, then, and if Jesus really is the difference between heaven and hell, <coughs> should we be living as if Jesus is the most important thing or the most important person in our lives? Ask yourself if, if, if you're living like that right now. Is Jesus, do people know that Jesus is the most important person in your life? Don't just tell your children that Jesus is important. Show them by your actions and your words and what you do with your money and your time and your worship. If Jesus is the difference between heaven and hell, and if Jesus is the most important thing, remind your children every single day that they are saints triumphant. If you wonder if you're ready, don't wonder. Know that you're ready. Because of Jesus' death and his resurrection, he has made you a saint in this world, which will then be transferred into the saints triumphant church. These end times, they can be scary times because you think of the end of the world. You think of the destruction that is going to come upon the world and, and, and the terrible nature of what that's going to entail. Don't be sad or scared about the end times. Be joyful because the end times remind us that these times are going to end. The times that are filled with wickedness that has never seen any precedent. The times that have, have been evil and you think that can this world get any worse now? And you think that it can't, but then it does the next day because you read something else in the paper? These end times are going to end. Jesus is going to return. He's going to stand triumphantly upon the earth. And the day that he does, believers will be, distract, will be delivered from distress of all times and delivered once and for all to heaven. Listen to the words again that remind us of that time. But at that time, your people, that's you, the saints, everyone whose name is found written in the book will be delivered forever. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which goes beyond our understanding will guard and keep your hearts and your minds in the true faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue, by, we continue by using the Nicene Creed as our statement of faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, the law that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, to true God from true God, the God of the Lord. Thank you.
every week, and you'll find that in your bulletin or also on the screen. A special prayer, um, because this past Thursday was Veterans Day, we will also include a prayer for our Veterans Day. We pray. Loving God, you created the universe that surrounds us and the earth on which we live. You control all things through your Son, who sits at your right hand in glory. Comfort us, us and us Give your word power as it works in our hearts. Clear away confusion and demolish our doubts. Destroy the apathy that often attacks us. Send your spirit to strengthen our confidence in your promises and our desire to live according to your will. Take away our love and sin and restore us each day by your grace. The signs of the times warn us that we are in the end times. Protect us from skeptics who ignore your truth. Spare us and Christians around the world from all forms of hate and persecution. Keep your word pure among us and guard us against Satan's attacks. Give us courage to carry the cross to the nations and joy. When we stand before you at the last judgment, look away from our sins and hold in your heart the perfect sacrifice of your Son, our Savior Jesus. Keep your promise and judge us by his merits so that we may gain the paradise he gained for all. Keep our faith, Holy Son Jesus, as we approach your holy throne. Instill in the hearts of our children a desire to follow you as they prepare for life. Help them distinguish between what is passing and eternal, between the instant gratification and lasting joy. Mold us and move us to be faithful Provide wisdom and insight to the leaders of our nation as they address the terrors and tragedies of our world. Lead them to cooperate with others to bring down evil and offer relief. Prosper the work of Christian missionaries who proclaim the gospel in warring and peaceful nations. Protect our cities and neighborhoods from crime and disasters. Hold in your care, Lord, those who are experiencing physical and emotional pain, and all those who are afflicted by disease or facing death. Pour out your compassion on the grieving and comfort those who are mourning the loss of a loved one. Who loves to pray for his brothers and sisters and to help when he can? Hear us, Lord, as we now pray in Heavenly Father, as we observe Veterans Day this past week in our nation, we thank you today for all who are veterans of our armed forces. You created government to provide peace and order in our society. You have given to government the power of the sword to keep peace and defend our land, so that we may worship you in peace and quietness. We praise you for keeping us safe through the service of the veterans among us. We thank you for so many brave men and women who have given of their time and lives to give us the freedoms to worship you. We pray for all those who have served. Give comfort to those who struggle, healing to those who hurt, hope to those who despair, and courage to those who continue to serve us around the world. Bless military families with the strength to face each day's challenges and the faith to place their lives and their loved ones into your care. May they find peace in your promise. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Dear Lord, we, pray, we place our veterans, our soldiers, and our country into your powerful hands. May you continue to control the events of our world for the good of your people. Whether we pray together or alone, you have promised to hear and answer us because of the work of your Son, Jesus. Give us patient and willing faith to accept your blessings in whatever way you send them. In your love and wisdom, prepare us for the day when you will take us to be with you forever. Hear us for Jesus' sake, and also as he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, in the communion of all your saints gathered into one body of your Son, you have surrounded us with so great a cloud of witnesses that we, encouraged by their faith and strengthened by their fellowship, may run with perseverance the race that is set before us, and together with them receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Amen. Get the melody line somewhat committed to your head and then we'll join together and sing the second verse together. 